So at the end of the last video, we were talking about how the Amanita is one of the strongest facilitators of the entoptic or microscopic experience. For those who don't know, and as your name suggests, the Amanita induces dreamlike, sedative, and euphoric states. It's not technically a psychedelic, it's more of a deliriant, but it has hallucinatory and psychoactive compounds. And of course it has to be prepared properly. A large focus of my channel has been to explore the Amanita in ancient religions and mythologies. While other entheogens were certainly used, the Amanita stands out among all of them as the most prevalent and the most highly regarded or the most sacred. And the reason this is the case is because it's a dream or meditative substance. While there is any number of entheogens that can induce an entoptic experience, the Amanita muscaria seems uniquely suited for entoptic experience. It is quite literally a key or gateway into the underworld or the spiritual world, which is the microscopic. Even without any entheogens, you can still access that meditative, entoptic, or microscopic state. I have an older video on my YouTube channel on how to access that meditative state, but I can certainly make a new one if people are interested. But the idea is, if you're able to get into that microscopic, meditative state without any help, Imagine what you can do with the aid of a properly administered Amanita dose. I believe it's these entoptic dreams that have given rise to most of the world religions and the various cults throughout the ancient world. This mushroom is the primary myth maker of humans. Some famous individuals throughout history are Joseph Smith, Ezekiel, Siddhartha, Muhammad, Zarathustra, and many others as well as being the center of many cults. Evidence of this mushroom's use can be found in almost every part of the world, from Aztec to Celtic to Russian, Japan, the Middle East, Egypt, Greece, pretty much everywhere the mushroom grows, which is most of the world. To clarify, I'm not trying to make any scientific, religious, medical, or moral judgments or teachings. These are just my observations and speculations into various topics. But the Amanita as a primary facilitator of microscopic experience is why it's so prevalent. I'm not saying that all of these different cultures and civilizations and religions were using this mushroom all the time. What likely happened was either a select few or an individual used it, and a lot of these myths came down from that experience or those experiences. A good example of this is Santa Claus, a personification of this mushroom. Even though Santa is used as an icon for Christmas in winter, our culture is not one that is constantly eating this mushroom. But imagine two or three thousand years from now, archaeologists are looking at our civilization, and they find tucked away in boxes in everyone's houses icons of Santa. If they're able to connect Santa to the Amanita muscaria, they may think that our culture every winter would be eating this mushroom. Likewise, when we're looking at ancient civilizations and mythologies, they could have themes that originated from the Amanita muscaria, but not something that was relevant or even known in everyday society. Another example of something commonly used that comes from the Amanita that most people don't realize is down the rabbit hole. The reason Alice was able to go down the rabbit hole, which is where the expression comes from, is because she ate this Amanita mushroom that shrunk her. One of the possible effects of the Amanita is to make you feel tiny, which of course lends itself to that microscopic phenomenon. The author, Lewis Carroll, had experience with the Amanita. Inversely, the mushroom can make you feel larger, which is why Mario eats it and he gets bigger. But Alice's experience of the mushroom as a gateway or a key into a different realm is maintained throughout mythology. The mushroom is a bridge into the spiritual world or the underworld. So now we're going to look at different gateway and transition gods. St. Peter and Janus are two archetypes that fulfill that role as gatekeepers and keyholders. The two-faced Janus represents a duality of two complements. Indoors and outdoors, day and night, the beginning of the year and the end of the year. The month of January is named after Janus. As the gatekeeper, his shrines were arches and crossing places and gates. St. Peter is given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and he is told, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. St. Peter is also named after the word rock, and he is the cornerstone or the rock from which the church is built. St. Peter is also associated with the rooster because of the transition from day to night, and the rooster is what signals that. The rooster is also related to rocks, which we'll see in a second. 
Another similar archetype is the Persian cult of Mithra that also made its way to Rome. Mithra was a solar deity and he was considered rock-born and he was worshipped mainly in caves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, they say, and drank from the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Another similar boundary god, who is also a dream and messenger god, is Hermes, whose name means stone or rock, much like Peter. Hermes was represented as a boundary or landmark where they would put these kind of square statues in different areas. Here are some examples, and they're obviously suggestive of the male generative principle. The tapering at the bottom is representative of the female generative principle, or the yoni. And much like St. Peter, he's also associated with the rooster. And as we know, another name for the rooster doubles as the phallus, hence why those other statues had the depiction of the phallus on them. We also see the same duality in the hermetic expression as above, so below. Hermes is also associated with Thoth and Mercury. Here are some more examples of the rooster phallus imagery. The rooster is featured on top of many churches, and it is a solar image as the rooster signifies a new day. Hence, the crow of the rooster being a sign of betrayal and lamentation, as Peter denied it. An important symbolism in Hinduism is the lingam, which is the male phallus and the female yoni put together. Rock and stone imagery and lingams are used throughout the entire world and are a common or popular motif. In the Egyptian Book of the Dead, there's an interesting reference to a rock gatekeeper. The doors of heaven are opened for me, the doors of earth are opened for me, the bars and bolts of Seb are opened for me, and the first temple hath been unfastened for me by the god Petra. So clearly rocks and transition and gatekeeper gods go hand in hand. But to understand why the male and female aspects are so accentuated in these motifs and symbolisms, we can actually look at the alchemical rebus. It's a hermaphroditic symbol combining the sun and the moon, the male and the female. In this famous depiction of the rebus, we can see what appears to clearly be an Amanita muscaria mushroom. Even the belt seems to be representing the Amanita muscaria. In the origin of these symbols in mythology, they basically saw the sun as a giant phallus as well as a giant mushroom cap. The moon was a yoni, the cosmic egg. It's the early growth stage of the Amanita. Here it's covered in the universal veil, and then it slowly grows and spreads open. The base of a mushroom is called a vulva with an O. And similar to that, mushroom is also another word that is sometimes used for the phallus. But it's because this mushroom was seen to be self-regenerating. They didn't see any seeds for it, so they thought that it contained both the male and female aspects. Hence the rebus, the hermaphrodite, and the lingam. Another similar transition god is Heimdallr. Time dollar signals when the gate is opened that allows someone to travel between worlds and it's also represented by a rainbow. These could very well be personification of thunder and the rainbow that follows rain. Amanita likes to grow after rain and thunder, so those were signs that the gateway was open. Another solar rock archetype is Sisyphus. Sisyphus had tricked Hades multiple times and stopped death from occurring. As punishment, he was forced to roll the boulder. I think Sisyphus is a solar archetype that just didn't become popular. He is tasked with moving a boulder, which is a representation of the sun every day. It bears resemblance to Kepri, who is a solar deity who has to roll the sun into place every morning. There's many more doorway and liminal gods, but these are some of the more popular ones. They all kind of deal with this idea of transitions of portals and doorways and gateways. A combination of the sun and moon, the underworld, and the waking world. The main idea is that these myths are coming from dreams and entoptic phenomena, and how they use that to explain different things in the world. But like Santa Claus, it gets distributed out, and the origins aren't necessarily remembered. And so its meaning changes, it becomes a metaphor, it becomes a character, it's adapted into all of these different tales and explanations. The solar image of the living rock being the Amanita Muscaria. But the themes in this video is why I wear a Amanita earring and a scarab earring. But yeah, that's the end of the video, so thanks for watching.